We're glad to have you as part of our community because we know and you know that every community benefits from the power of parents. We have a very special afternoon in store for you with remarks from our executive director, Sue Kovitz, and a presentation from our guest speaker, Dr. Maureen O'Brien, developmental psychologist and former director of curriculum training and evaluation for Families First. We were so fortunate to have Maureen's leadership for 10 years, and we are thrilled she can join us today. Before I turn it over to Sue, just a few housekeeping notes. Please stay muted for the duration of the program. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Maureen's presentation. So please type any questions you have, including if you need technical assistance, into the chat to the Families First moderator. Um, and we will do our best to answer them all. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Sue. Thanks, Jen. Good afternoon and welcome. It really is nice to see both old and new friends here today. I'm gonna to share a little bit about leadership luncheons, which are an opportunity for us to bring together the Families First team, supporters, and partners to learn with us. Sometimes we feature the work and sometimes we feature an expert to sit with us and go deeper on a relevant topic. Today, we are bringing in an expert. Before we begin, I wanna share a little bit more about who we are and the work we do. At Families First, and you heard Jen say this, we believe that parents have the power to shape their children's futures and have a positive impact in their communities. The research and our 35 years of experience in parenting support tells us that if you want better outcomes for children, you have to focus on two things in early childhood, building the parent-child relationship and elevating the voices of parents in decisions, policies, and programs that impact their children's lives. Both matter. We offer two programs that do just that, the Power of Parenting and the Parent Leadership Program. We will reach 750 parents this year with our parenting workshops, leadership trainings, and community projects. And through all the programs, parents are at the center. I also wanna share that Families First was recently selected as one of the 11 finalists for the Zantz Innovation Challenge through the Harvard School of Education for our groundbreaking work in parent leadership and family engagement. We are the only organization in Massachusetts that was selected for our category. We are thrilled to be a finalist and I hope you will all join us as Magda Rodriguez, who spearheaded this work and Tiffany Benson, lead the pitch on April 27th. And now back to today. In our Power of Parenting program, we talk with many parents about the importance of temperament, communication as examples. And parents will often ask us about how to make sure that their child is resilient, feels confident. They ask, how can I support my child to feel good about themselves? In order to address these questions today, we are so excited to have Dr. Maureen O'Brien joining us. Maureen O'Brien is an expert in early childhood and is the founder of Destination Parenting. Maureen also worked at Families First, or Jen mentioned that, as the director of curriculum and training for over 10 years. She helped to build the power of parenting curriculum and is currently a consultant coach for parents and other organizations. It is simply a pleasure to introduce Maureen to all of you today to talk about raising your child's confidence. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Sue. That was lovely and formal. <laughs> um, it's so great to, to see everyone's faces. I want to thank Families First for inviting me back. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it is great to, to share some of the learnings that some of this you may know, some you may not about uh, boosting children's confidence. It's such an incredibly uh, important topic in this quote unquote age of anxiety that we're living in. And uh, it's a real antidote. So I'm, I'm pleased today to be able to share some thoughts on it. I'm interested in what your reaction is to what I'm saying, and um, hope we can spend the next you know 40 minutes or so together and learning from each other. So thanks for having me, and we'll we'll just dive right in. Um, and Hannah, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Great. So, I mean, I think, I think one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, as with any aspect of parenting, 
uh, there's two key ingredients, right? Confidence is something that I think it's very important that we all get our head around what it means. And then think about how as parents can we support uh, the, the growth of that confidence in our children. Um, the root of confidence is actually in the Latin word for trust. And so it really is about a child um, learning to have belief and trust in themselves and also belief and trust in who can help them uh, to navigate life's difficulties and life's challenges. And so in order for that to happen, I think, you know, what I'd like to do today is have parents and those of us who work with parents understand how to make them confidence coaches for their children. Um, and I deliberately chose the, the term boost in the title for this because you really can't instill it. Like, you know, it has to come from within. What you can do is shape it and work with it. But it, you know, I think sometimes parents overestimate <laughs> their role and underestimate the child's own role in developing um, such a skill. So, um, so in terms of this, this first slide, I just wanted to make sure we ground ourselves in very key principles that are built into um, Families First curriculum always anyway. One is knowing your child and the importance of understanding the individual that you're dealing with. And uh, those of us who have more than one child or interact with more than one child certainly know they bring a lot to the equation. And so how you work with them on boosting their confidence depends very much on whether you're dealing with a preschooler or a preteen. And um, there's different strategies that parents can use that I'll sort of get into in a second. Um, the second, you know, non-negotiable to think about as all the uh, program facilitators know is temperament. And so we will also be talking about that. Um, as the mom of twins, I can tell you that my children, you know, challenged me in different ways and had, um, different ways of expressing their lack of confidence when things happened and I had to make adjustments. And so you have to know yourself, know your child and create a confidence building environment around them. So, you know, for the last half of this slide, let's think about that. I think the number one um, uh, tactic that sometimes happens is parents end up jumping in really early and in the spirit of trying to help their child end up actually enabling a relationship where the parent can rely on them too much. And so I think making that distinction and figuring out how you can support your child and give them a sense of agency um, versus jumping with solutions is something that if parents learn that earlier, it makes the later years easier. So, um, you know, we've got some strategies to talk about that. The other is just frankly talking about the emotions that are attached, right? Confidence is something that has both a cognitive, a brain, you know, thinking piece and, uh, and a less, um, less, what's the word I want, practical and more emotional uh, contingent to it that involves a lot of emotions, stress, anxiety, fear. And so talking about that and, and pointing out to our children that we too have those emotions being vulnerable is another strategy parents can really use to help boost their child's confidence. And the final thing here is just encouraging trial and error. If you're a parent who likes to play it safe or your child is a, has a temperament that is slow to warm up and doesn't like to try new things, coming up with ways to have them comfortably take risks is something that, um, that you know, parents can keep in mind. Okay, so let's, let's move to the next slide. The idea is that, you know, parents can, you know, help their child, but it's a hard job to do it. And I saw this graphic, this meme one day on my feed, and it just made me laugh so hard because we all start the day wanting to be Mr. Rogers and being calm and cool and collected and open and, you know, giving our child all they want. And sometimes by the end of the day, we, we feel like a castaway, right? Um, and that's just because we care so much. And so I just want everyone to think as we're going through this, to give yourself some grace that we are all doing the best we can and that tomorrow's a new day and you can wake up like Mr. Rogers again. <laughs> okay, next slide. The other thing I'd love to introduce is the idea of flossum. I don't know how many of you have ever heard this word, but I personally want a t-shirt made with it. So the idea of flossum is that, you know, we can embrace our flaws and, it, and it's this battle back against perfectionism that can cause a real lack of confidence in children and social media and other aspects of the world that are out there um, can really contribute to a sense that, you know, there's supposed to be one way to do things and one way to be. And so I feel like instead of um, thinking about our children as, uh, you know, always working towards a goal, 
to accepting the child that we have, right? They've got flaws and they have incredible strengths as do we as parents. So I'd love you to kind of keep that in mind as we move along. So when I was thinking about this, I said, oh gosh, you know, how can I, how can I help people remember what, what um, I hope they'll come away with? And so I thought of there are three things around all of our houses that we can visualize that will help us understand how to be the kind of parent that we hope can really boost confidence in our children. Um, the first one was a mirror, and I'm sure that, you know, is something you can imagine why I put it up there. It reflects back who we are. When our child looks in a mirror, they see themselves in a certain way. Sometimes that mirror is accurate, and sometimes it can be very distorted. And so, next slide, please. Part of our role as parents is to help kids to understand that, um, you know, when, when their perspe perspective or perception of themselves might be a little bit out of whack. Because as adults, you know, we have the benefit of, um, of understanding the long term. We have the benefit of perspective that especially young children and teenagers don't have. There's a lot of parallels between early childhood and early teenhood in terms of vulnerability, inability to really express what's going on, getting frustrated. Um, and so acknowledging that with a lot of I statements, which again, we talk about in the curriculum a lot of families first, um, and acknowledging that we too have those emotions can help your child feel more competent as they face new skills. I mean, try to attain new skills. Um, next one. I love this idea of we all carry two brains with us. One is a wary brain and one is a thinking brain. And they work in parallel all the time. So it's a way parents can understand, you know, sort of technical terms like cognitive development or whatever, or uh, emotional development, you know, just think about we all have a worry brain and we all have a thinking brain. And the key to feeling confident is to not have your worry brain override or hijack your thinking brain. And the way to do that sometimes and um, is to break things down and we can help our children understand how not to get lost in the moment how to uh, emotionally regulate so that they don't jump to conclusions or worry too much about what their peers think or um, you know, other places that, that especially uh, as kids are unable to really take a step back like adults sometimes can, uh, that we can be that sort of force and, uh, and foundation for them. Uh, next thing is, oh yeah, to work, and this goes back to the help versus enable piece, really co-create solutions because confidence is not like, oh, I can do that. It's also, I know how to handle things when my parent isn't around, when my coach isn't around, um, when I'm really up there alone on the high diving board, right? Like I am in charge of this situation. I know what to do next. And in order to do that, it's like any other muscle. You have to practice, practice, practice. And parents can do that, you know, early on with young children by playing games and helping them understand strategy, by showing them that there's a pathway and that, you know, there's steps where you stop and you assess where you are. Um, and this builds executive function skills, which we all know are, you know, hugely important um, as kids grow and develop. And ultimately, we know that confidence um, and is, is something that is a buffer against anxiety and depression and all the sort of negative outcomes that none of us want for our child, but you know, very, uh, are very common these days, quite frankly. So involving them really actively is another really key thing um, to help kids uh, understand. And I love this little slide and it gives me my talking points. Um, pointing out kids' strengths. You know, I, unfortunately our brains are wired to negativity. Um, the news is just a great example of that, right? It grabs your attention, we pay attention to it and sometimes we get out of balance. So pointing out your child's strengths when they come home and they say, I failed something or I chickened out or, you know, I had this bad peer interaction, um, point out something really positive that they are showing you. Like, I'm so glad, you know, again, the I statements, I'm so glad you told me about it. First of all, um, it sounds like you were a good friend in that situation. I'm sorry that your teacher made you feel a certain way, whatever, the, whatever's going on. Um, but you know, boy, you're, 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 you're a kid who really understands. You're a child who's a go-getter. Whatever your phrasing is, just remind them that they have strengths. Um, and I think finally, this whole idea of not yet is very, very important. It's like my favorite three-letter word is yet. Maybe you can't do it yet, but let's keep working on it. 
Maybe you, you know, you aren't going to get there as fast as you like. And just by that little reframe, it can really change a child's perspective and kind of get them unstuck. Okay, next. Tool number two, you've got your mirror, right? Let's accurately reflect what's going on. Tool number two is a measuring tape. And I, you know, chose this more soft, you know, measuring tape, not the one that flips back and snaps and, and you know, feels very abrupt for a reason. It is about growth. And, uh, but it's also about flexibility and adapting to your child's um, growing sense of competence and confidence. Uh, and so I think that parents have to, and this is the hard part, you have to try to be both, right? You gotta be strong, but you also have to be positive and flexible and let your child take over. So the next slide tells us that one of the, one of the key things, as we all know, anyone associated with Families First knows that, you know, parents being the foundation and emotional secure base for kids is our number one job, right? But not every parent is willing to be vulnerable and talk about where they may be struggled. Uh, and there's real value in that for children because they measure themselves against what they see now in us, right? So they see a parent who's acting a certain way. They see the end point. They didn't see our process. And so pointing that out and being vulnerable is another way to say to them, you know, you can get through hard things. We can, as Glennon Doyle says, we can do hard things, right? Um, so I think that's a huge uh, way parents can help children um, develop confidence. The other is to, um, you know, as I said earlier, break, break steps down so that things are achievable. I think kids often jump to the end, right? Skip steps. And in this world of instant gratification, they can get really frustrated in the middle. And so identifying where those, where those markers are and stopping and pausing and saying, you know, let's, let's, let's reflect on how far we've come. Um, comparing their own progress, not comparing them to other children. And I think that's a really hard thing to do as a parent. And in this society, everybody's always comparing to others. And so what I want you to measure is not your child vis-a-vis -vis other children, but where is your child growing now compared to where he or she was six months ago? Um, and really praise them in a way that, that shows that you value that growth and that maybe there were hiccups along the way, but you can see that progress. They often, because of their brain development, are not as fully capable to go back and reflect. They really get caught up in the moment. So it's our job to praise effectively, which means specifically using you know, very, uh, very um, easy to understand examples and, and not being fake about it. Kids are so in tune to when we're sort of falsely praising them uh, or, you know, the good job kind of thing is, you know, it loses its meaning. So really saying, wow, you know, the last time you, you read a poem in public, you really, um, you know, it seemed like you were more nervous. You were more confident this time. And I really noticed that and the audience noticed that. And then finally, this whole idea of resourcefulness, like the things that they're able to achieve when we're not around. And, and helping them to see those moments as victories. So first time they get on the bus by themselves for kindergarten is one example. First time they try out for a club or learn a new language is an example. Encouraging that kind of safe risk keeping. So like this little, the child on the left, you know, he's not gonna jump all the way to the third disc. He's gonna have to get to the next, next disc. He has to kind of gradually find his way. And, you know, that's, that's something that builds confidence. You know, last time it's a visual, right? First time I could only get to the lowest one. Now I can get to the middle one. And just keeping, um, keeping that and narrating that is important. Okay, next. Third tool, third final tool, headphones. Um, and, you know, the thing about headphones are they help you tune in to whatever you need to focus on. And they also help you tune out the noise. And I think that parents can really help children develop that skill because as we know, once kids are school age, the peers kind of take over their brain, right? They care so much about what, how they compare to, their, to the others in their world. Parents' impact is a little bit more in the background, even though it's super solid. And so um, next slide, please. I think that you know, this is where the key communication skills that we talk about at Families First really, really matter. Number one, and this is my key phrase, I've used it with colleagues, I've worked, used it with all kinds of folks in my life, ask the question, do you want me to listen or do you want advice? Just sit with that for a second and imagine somebody says that to you when you're struggling with your confidence. Do you want me to listen or do you want advice? 
And sometimes the person will say, I really just want you to listen. I need, I need to vent. I'm upset. You know, I, I need to work it through for myself. And then you have to hold up your end of the deal, right? And really just listen. That's the hard part. So, you know, for me, I sometimes, I mean, my kids would, would, you know, be horrified about this, but like, they'll be talking to me and I'll be listening and I'll be taking notes <laughs> because I have to let that part out. Like, oh no, you know, but I don't say it directly to them. It's like, I need, I need to make sure that they feel like I'm only listening or, and sometimes second step, they'll say, okay, now I'm in a space where I can hear some advice, but starting out with the advice can often shut kids down and take away their agency. And I think that's, a, you know, something we really don't want to have happen to them. Okay. So second thing, encouraging positive self-talk. It's such an important thing that they believe in themselves and they, it's, it's authentic, right? That I am a good person, that I am honest, that I don't allow, I have zero tolerance for bullying, whatever, whatever their thing is, that they can repeat that in their head, can get them through really scary moments. Um, and it, it moves us away again from, from, you know, this idea that you have to be perfect. Like, it's okay to say, for instance, you know, I, I may be a decent speaker, but I'm a terrible singer. I just know that about myself, right? But if I tried to take a risk and I did karaoke one day, right? Like, it's, it would be something to, to use as an example with my children. It could be like, look, I know I'm not that good at it, but just the fact I went up there and tried is something I am proud of. And to try to get them to make similar statements in their head can really help boost their, their confidence. And then the last one is watching nonverbals. Now, this is huge for people who don't have good poker faces. <laughs> um, you know, it's like you might use the right words and you might be following the right script, whatever that is. But if your nonverbals are communicating something different, 80% of what we know is visual, right? And so your child is not going to listen. Your child is not going to hear those words, even if they're great words, because you look disappointed, because you look angry, because you look impatient. And, you know, so it's really important, and it kind of goes back to the mirror at the beginning, that we think about our own biases and what we expect from our children. You know, are our expectations reasonable? Uh, are they, in fact, um, age appropriate? Do we, oh, Mariana likes that one. <laughs> do they, you know, do they match what our child is like? Because they are always, always, always watching. And then reversely, look at your child and their nonverbals too, right? Because sometimes they tell us what they think we want to hear. They just want us, especially as they get older, you know, they want us off their back. They want to move past the moment. And if your child's like, yeah, it's cool, I had a good day, but you see them sulking or they, you know, dashed off to their room or in some way communicate something, it's important to try to boost their confidence, maybe not in the moment. They may need that time to settle down, to reduce their worry brain, to, you know, get their thinking brain back on board. And that's particularly true for kids with ADD, with highly sensitive natures. You need to sometimes pause and we talk at Families First about how power, power, ooh, the power of pausing and the fact that that can allow everything to settle so that, again, our words can be heard more effectively. So, you know, some people say that the, you know, the key thing to do is to try to, um, when you are critiquing, it's not all, you know, it's not all roses. It's not all positivity uh, that's going to boost your child's confidence. It's also this idea that, you know, we can sit through these hard things, but I am with you. I'm your foundation. You can come and communicate and talk to me. And I'm going to go to you for some solutions. I'm not going to try to solve everything for you. And next one. I think we were going to try to put up, I don't know if it happened or not, a, uh, a visual of what you all thought confident, com confidence was. Uh, before we switch to Q and A, because I was curious, everybody has their own sort of definition for it. So um, I was curious if if we have that. I'm not sure, and if not, we can go right to questions. Oh, look at that! Look how smart you all are. Does anyone see anything that they would like to call out, or does anyone have a thought, or um, did anything sort of resonate for you? I'm just curious about that.
Thank you, Aisha. Somebody pick a tool. Which one of those tools is something that they might want to like visualize using with their child? I, I have a question, but I, I know you just asked a question. So I, I wonder if you're going to pause. Okay. No, go right um, ahead. I think this is so great. And I find it really interesting in the um, word cloud here that like sort of cheerleading or the idea that parents are their kids cheerleader, which I think is a lot of the time, certainly a frame that I hear about when people think about how to build children's confidence. Mm -hmm. But I, I get that that doesn't always leave a lot of room for children to share their experience. But I'm wondering sort of how do, you, how do you frame that when working with families that might have that frame where they feel like that's, that's the way that they're supposed to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you build on, I think, sort of, you know, that path of, of good intentions that doesn't always lead in the right, <laughs> to the right destination? Right, right. Because it comes from a heartfelt, that's a great question. It comes from a heartfelt place, right? Like the cheerleading is, the intent of that is to build up your child and to have them sit up straight and feel good about themselves, right? So if I was talking to parents, I'd say that is the goal, right? We want our child to feel really good about themselves. So the goal isn't wrong. It's just that how we approach it sometimes has to vary, right? So you can you can cheerlead your child's strengths, for example, and have that really be feel real um, and point that out to them and build them up. But if that's all you do, you're not going to hit that growth factor, right? You, you're not going to be able to help them to deal with challenges. And so that's where the, the cheerleading has to be tempered a bit with um, asking the question of like, you know, let's say our child comes home and they had a, um, I don't know, they, they took a swimming lesson and they didn't do well, right? And, and, you know, they come in and you could just say as a parent, oh, you know, I'm so glad you went, you know, I'm sure you did better than you think, like your instinct is kind of to dismiss and minimize sometimes the child's difficult emotion. Whereas the difference between that and saying to a child, um, huh, I, you know, I wonder, I wonder why today didn't go well. Stop. Full stop. I wonder if there's something that you think could go differently next time. Full stop. And, and just planting those seeds doesn't mean as a parent, you're not like already thinking about what your solution is, right? You're already thinking, oh, I might call the coach and I might do this. I might do that sort of behind the scenes. But if you jump in with that, the child doesn't have the opportunity to build that skill set. And so the cheerleading gets you only so far in terms of the child building their like self-regulation and their ability to identify who other helpers are. Um, so, I, so I think that those are really key things and I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah. Great. It's a good one. I, thank yeah. you. I have sure. a, I have a question. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Hi. I, hi, Maureen. I'm wondering if you could comment on help seeking behavior. It seems to me that one of the variables that often differentiates success in all sorts of domains for, for parents, but as, as well as children, is the ability to ask for help um, and where and how that plays itself all, out in early childhood. It, it certainly is a significant element in, in school settings, mm -hmm. but in home settings. So do you have any thoughts about help-seeking behavior and any advice in that arena? So in terms of helping the child to develop the skills to ask for help or to, or when do they helping them know when they need help? Well, I, th I think it involves both. It certainly yeah. involves some reflection on what are moments when I need help. But mm -hmm. the ability, I think we as adults are, find ourselves sometimes in situations where we would never ask for help. It, it mm -hmm. creates a degree of insecurity. Mm -hmm. But there are many people I know who are excellent it helps seeking behavior and feel, mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly, you need to feel confident in order to open yourself up. Right. So, so I, I think, how is it that you create an environment where kids understand it's, it's okay to ask for help. Yeah. Uh, you need to acknowledge you, you need it. But yeah. I mean, many of us, there, there's certainly arenas in my life where I would never admit that I needed help. Right. But hopefully they're few and far between. 
Well, I think that's that's so important to think about the life skill aspect of it, right? Because con confidence is something that one carries through life. And to some degree, it depends on who that person is, right? Because again, it goes back to temperament, right? For some people who are extroverted, it's much easier to go and ask for help. For someone who has a more introverted personality or maybe hasn't had a lot of role modeling around them of asking for help, they may very much struggle, right? So I think it's help-seeking behavior is like another muscle that they can strengthen, right? And it takes early practice. And then reinforcement, I think, is where parents miss the boat a lot. Wow, that's so great that you, you know, asked your teacher to, to stay after school because you were struggling with math. Um, you know, do you feel better about it? And sort of pointing out how the consequence of asking for the help actually move them along and, and reduce their anxiety or whatever's going on for them. So I think that part of it is pointing out to them who the helpers are. Part, part of it is the timing. You know, for some kids, um, asking for help in the moment is too hard. They're just, that worry brain is overwhelmed. And to ask for help feels like extra. It's, it, you know, now I have to worry about who I'm going to ask and how I'm going to ask. And they're going to think I'm stupid. And, you know, it becomes this narrative in the head of anxious children. Um, and so getting in there early and sort of seeing when your child, if you're a teacher or a parent, is starting to struggle is really important. So you don't want to let them, when I say like, don't enable, it's also like, don't throw them in the deep end without a, without a, a you know, life jacket, right? It's like, help them wade in and say, wow, you look like you're getting a little tense. Let's, you know, what, what can we, instead of saying, let's go get a snack, what would make you feel better? And again, flipping that agency to them. And then at the end of it, circling it back and saying, I'm so glad you asked me. I'm so glad you asked me because I would have been nervous in that situation too. And then you join them. You've given them the agency of, you know, it's a good idea for us for help. And then hopefully, you know, it doesn't always happen. They've, they've achieved something from that. And they got sort of internally positively reinforced for asking for help too. Thank you. Anyone else? What about my program facilitator folks? You must get questions like this for your with for parents. How do you how do they talk about confidence with their with their families? Hi, Maureen. Hi, Beth. Um, so I had an experience recently with um, one of the groups I'm facilitating where the parents were challenged by behavior in their household and they sat the family down, the kids, they're, this is a three to eight. So, you know, three or four and seven year old. And they said, look, this is a problem. What are we as a family going to do to find some answers? And together they brainstormed and created a list. So that was a, I thought a really powerful um, approach to something that everybody experiences. That's great. And contrast that with at least the way I grew up, which is, you know, there would not have been a family meeting about this. <laughs> you know, there might there might have been some discussion, quote unquote, but somebody's agenda would like override, right? It would be like, well, that's that's the way we're gonna do it. And, you know, a lot of us come from a background like that, right? Or and so this idea of kids having agency is relatively new, like really acknowledging that agency and seeing it as a powerful thing. And, you know, yet we know that that agency is something to Barbara's point that helps you later in life. And so, you know, if that's, if that's the pathway we're on, then that's the skill you want a bit. It can be threatening as a parent though, right? You know, like as your kids get older, like, you know, I looked like Tom Hanks and Castaway when my boys were teenagers. Like that was a hard, hard time for me because I had to let go of my control. Right. And I was, you know, sort of used to being the one who ran the ship. And, and yet, you know, occasionally there'd be these glimmers of, wow, by stepping back, you know, my child really achieved something on their own or, you know, or, you know, one point I yelled at them about something and, and my son said, mom, you should practice what you preach. <laughs> and I was like, ouch. Right. But also he was correct. <laughs> you know, I was wedding, I was letting my emotions get the best of me in that moment. And so part of me was like, you little bugger. And then the other part of me was like, he's really understood how to stand up for himself and, you know, to call me out when, when I'm not practicing what I preach. So, you know, in the moment, did I love that? No, but I woke up the next day going, you know, he's listening. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody else have a thought? I don't even, I'm not watching time very well. So do we have I, time for one more? Yeah, I, I have a question here in the chat. Um, could you share some other resources for helping children understand their emotions? Wow. Um, well, <laughs> interestingly, this is so fascinating. I love the whole family first connection. Um, we had an intern named Chelsea Elliott, who's a social worker um, a couple of years ago. And she actually has created a whole curriculum that's online um, and it's called Somo Calm Lab. S, it's a terrible name, I would say to remember. S, it's like social emotional, whatever, but it's S O M O C O M Lab, I think. And it's that's just one example, but she has created like a game that allows children and parents to, to play and work together on the emotion, on the social emotional skills. And um, and she just got selected for some like create award, like, you know, black entrepreneurship or something like that and went to Forbes for training. I think it's going to blow up. I'm just really excited about it. Um, but I do think that, you know, the idea of uh, doing it in non-threatening situations is really important. So kids can learn a lot from family games, from um, the family meetings that one of you brought up. Uh, those are like safe places to practice um, there's a great, uh, online, there's also something called, um, developmental assets. And I, I don't have, I can send it later. Um, but it lists like 40 strengths. So let's say you're struggling with what your kid is good at, because you could be just at an impasse, right. Or, or you're blocked about seeing their strengths. And it identifies all these different categories of strengths. Some people have strengths in relationships. Some people have strengths in problem solving, you know, and it just helps you as a parent flip your script a little bit and see what, you know, wow, like, look at that, you know, she's driving me nuts, but she's really good at this, this, and this. Um, so I like that one a lot. And then for teachers, there's something called tools of the mind um, that has a lot of activities and tips that one can use in a classroom, but could also be like adopted by parents too. Great. Thanks, Maureen. Sure. Uh, I see Danubia has a question. Go ahead. Um, as you know, thank you so much. This was very helpful. Um, when we are busy parents, we tend to forget how to, um, you know, go back and support the child because you're so busy trying to change the world in the systems. <laughs> so thank you for reminding us of those of, of everything and also how important it is to be vulnerable because there's this societal um, big, like a big assumption or like a, a fake belief, a social construct that we have to be strong no matter what, but our right. children need to see that you can't be strong all the time. Mm -hmm. And my question is around how, when they're young, it's easy to talk about emotions and there are like certain tools. Like what I did is I had a chart, honestly, it's just a table with the, our names, how are you feeling today? And then I had a feelings wheel that she would point how she felt. Love it. And then you'd be very simplistic, right? The, the major emotions and then the emotions that came off of that, which would build her vocabulary too. Fantastic. But then it came to a point where, and then, so what, what do you need? Like, if you're feeling sad, what do you need? And then like, oh, I need a nap. I need a quiet time. I need to take a shower. So it's strategies for mm -hmm. self-care and to, and to take care of your emotions. But now as a teenager, that doesn't quite work. So <laughs> What would be like a next step for that? She's 12. So I'm That's, like, I was gonna say, you, play, you, is there a womb that I can put you back for the next two years? <laughs> and come out fully formed, right? Yeah, because um, right now I'm just like, I failed. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm telling you. Anytime you talk to families or parents about emotion, about growth, about building skills, the first emotion that comes up for parents is guilt. And I hate that. I hate that. You know, it's like, I, I don't want people to come away feeling guilty. I want them to come away feeling, I am sharing how hard this is. We all mess up. We all learn from our mistakes. And if we show that to our preteens, especially, that's a tough, especially girls, right? That that like, you know, 11 to 14 is is like survivor, right? <laughs> Um, and, and so I think that, yeah, like, you know, some of the, some of the gadgets don't work anymore, right? They're, they're immature. It's stupid. It's this, it's that. So you'll get a lot of pushback, right? Verbally. And I think just letting that bounce off you, like you're a marshmallow is very important. <laughs> um, and not to take it personally, because it's really hard to hear that, you know, when you're, you're your kid, you know, I don't want to be around you, all of that. Um, one of the things I did with my twins, and I don't know if I read it or I just knew to do it. 
I would, I would just give them a number scale. I'd be like, you know, so, you know, because they didn't want to tell me, how's your day? Fine. You know, how's your day? Uh, fine. I don't want to talk about it, whatever. And I'd say, okay, one to 10, how stressful was your day? One to 10, you know, how hard was that for you? And, and they'd give me a number. And then I'd sometimes go, huh, you know, based on, on, you know, how you look at, you look either like, you know, let's say he says it's a five, right? I'd say, wow, because I would have guessed eight by the way you came in the door. And sometimes they wouldn't respond, but sometimes they would, and it would open the door to a conversation, right? But it's also like a quick, easy, safe answer that says, I'm touching base with you. But if you tell me that, like, I don't want, how much you want to talk to me today? Who? You got to say, okay. Okay. Right. And then you call your friend. <laughs> You know, my kid hates me, right? Um, so you do have to get a little more creative. Um, it's a lot of coming in sideways. You know, it used to be car time, but now they've got headphones in their ears all the time. So car time doesn't work anymore. Um, that can be a struggle. You can, you can, you know, ask for a non-screen time at a certain time of night. You can put them in charge of what they want to do. I think it's like a handoff. You just have to kind of hand it off and, and be open to them not always treating you graciously. <laughs> But they're listening. They are listening. My boys are now 28 years old and they'll, you know, they say things that make, you know, back, that, mom, the statute of limitations has run out and they'll tell me about something that happened a while ago and they'll say, but I had your voice in my head and I knew, you know, X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, that, that's the validation, right? That's, the, that's when you stick into it for the long term. Thank you so much. I'm starting to read the book from the five languages of love for teenagers. Because the, the, when they're young, it works, but then we kind of lose them right now. So they, mm -hmm. they, it's a new book. So that's really been kind of helpful. I just started. So I can report Great. back on how that goes. Thank you. Great resource. And hang in there. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Do we have any other questions before we close for today? Thank you. I believe Sue will say a few words. I, I just want to say it was a even my kids are 24 and 26. And and certainly I was do, doing a lot of reflecting back and thinking about raising my kids, perhaps where, where some of the things went well and some of the things didn't go well. But uh, you gave us so many incredible tips and tools and things that will stay with us, I think, afterwards, you know, as we think about uh, the Flossum in particular was a, a perfect one. We may get those shirts made up yeah. at Families First and walk around <laughs> in them. But I also love the not yet. I mean, I think that that's such an important thing to think about. You know, we don't just go from here to here overnight. It is a journey. You know, we think about that all the time in our work that, you know, parents are on a journey and they're they're learning and we, you know, we step in at a critical, you know, window of time when when it's that young age and brains are developing and there's a lot of opportunity. But it is it is a journey. It's a lifetime commitment. And you've reminded us of that, that it's really important um, to keep thinking about these things. But uh, I want to just say thank you and and how much we appreciate your sharing your wisdom with us this morning uh, and look forward to continuing to have you back at other times, which I'm sure we will. And I will now turn it over to, I think it's Jen who will close us. Great. Thank you, Sue. And, and thank you, Maureen, Thanks, for sharing with us today. And, and to all of you for being here and for your participation and great questions and, and comments. I think we all are going home with a, a lot more tools in our in our resource boxes today. Um, and so I really want to thank you all for um, the lovely conversation and also want to invite you to please mark your calendars for our next leadership luncheon will be on May 30th with June Lei Lee who serves as the co-chair of the Human Development and Education Program and the Saul Zand Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He will be speaking about the culture and message of being enough and helping parents recognize what it means to be enough for their children. A very relatable topic. I hope we can see many of you there. So please stay tuned for that invitation. The event will be held at, in person at the Boston Public Library. Thank you and have a great afternoon.